Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Friday, March 5th, 2021. I am Dave Biddle. I am very happy to be joined by Jonah Booker for his usual Friday visit. A lot to get into, Jay Book. Let's start with, of course, spring ball kicking off two weeks from today. It just feels like, you know, I mean, it's the old adage, you know, you can't win the national championship in the spring, but you sure as hell can lose it, as coaches like to say. And, and you know, it's going to be interesting this year because I think sometimes maybe as fans and as media people, we might overrate spring ball here and there. But this year it feels like there's going to be so much extra juice just because of the fact that last year basically got canceled. They had three spring practices that they, get, they got in and it got canceled. So I just feel like we always get into spring football around here, as you know. I feel like there's just extra juice this year. Speak on that and just – from your professional opinion as being a former college football player and a savant of the game itself, how important is spring football? Spring football is extremely important, especially for the younger guys, um, because what you have during the regular season, if you're a younger guy and you're, you're maybe on that second, that second rotation of guys, once the season starts, you're essentially practicing your own plays and you're, uh, practicing what the other team is going to be doing as far as looks on offense and defense. And if you're not in that too deep, chances are you're on the scout team. So what happens on the scout team? You are basically mimicking the team, the opponent that you're going to be playing that particular week. So there's during the season, there's not a lot of actual competition for younger guys to really thrive um, to show that they, you know, their game has evolved. Once the spring comes, that's the opportunity that you really start to see your back end of your roster start to develop. Guys start, younger guys who really didn't get a lot of reps and the opportunity, this is their time to shine. And for Ohio State, it's critically important this year to have a full spring after last year because with Kerry Combs coming on last year as a, as a first-time defensive coordinator, you know, they were hamstrung with him being able to fully implement his defense and getting everyone on the same page. And I truly believe that did play a a major role in the defense taking a major step back. So now that he's going to have a full spring, it's critical that they get down to the basics, which is fundamentals and understanding what he's asking of them so that once the season comes around, They've had several weeks of digesting the playbook, understanding the nuances of it, because once once you once you're the Big Ten and you say the season's off, you know, people are shutting it down, then boom, season's on. Well, guess what? You have a couple weeks to get ready. When you're getting ready, you're you're getting your body ready because you, you once fall once fall camp opens up, it's all about getting your body conditioned and ready to play in the grind of the Big Ten. So for, for Kerry Combs, it's critically important for him as far as his future with the program to make sure that he gets those younger guys developed, but more importantly, making sure that everyone on the defense understands what is being asked of them. And at the same time, start building on the playbook because what you saw to me, especially in the secondary, was a very vanilla playbook. If he can start to... Uh, kind of diversify what he's asking of them as far as coverages, I think it will greatly benefit the secondary. I want to get into position battles that intrigue you. We'll go on the offensive side of the ball first, then we'll go to the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, just speak on the different position groups, the battles that intrigue you the most, and to give a prediction of who's going to win those battles. We'll yeah. Offense. Um, okay. Uh, you know, we're starting on the offense. To me, I'm I'm very curious about what the what the running back pecking order is going to look like once all the dust settles because you know you have your elder statement and Master T. He's a guy that will get reps no matter what people say on the message boards and, and the social media. 
Master Teague will play some form or fashion because what you're doing is you're breaking in a new quarterback who has very little experience. You're going to need uh, a veteran guy who's going to be able to handle blitz pickups. So that is a, a strength of Master T. But the, I love Mayan Meatball Williams. I thought he performed exceptionally well uh, in his role once he got on the field. I thought he ran hard. He showed a, a level of elusive that you can't teach because that jump cut that he had and he shown against Clemson, that's something that you just can't teach. That's that's natural giving ability. And then obviously you have your uh, your highly talented true freshmen coming in with Trevion Henderson and Evan Pryor. And then you can't forget um, Steel Chambers and uh, Marcus Carley. So the running back room is – it's very crowded, so I'm curious to see how that's going to shake out. If I'm making a prediction, I, I'm going off the grid here. I think Mayan Williams is going to win the starting running back position. I know everyone says Trevion Henderson's the next guy, and I do believe he will be a special talent, but I just think that Meatball is going to be the one who end up winning that that running back position, but I, I do believe you'll see at least three guys getting touches this year. I like it. Now give me, before we move on to defense, give me one more. It can be quarterback. That's always the, the sexy pick. <laughs> or you can give me, you can give me center with Harry Miller and Matthew Jones, as I reported today on Buck Nuts. The, those guys are going to be competing at center. I think it's going to be Harry Miller at center and Matthew Jones will stay at left guard, but they want to at least see what happens there. Give me one more. It could be X receiver. Give me one more position battle that you're intrigued with on the offensive side of the ball and give me the prediction of who's going to win said battle. Yeah. I want, everyone will say quarterback, what's going on there. I'm going to shy away from that and I'm going to go uh, with one of the guard guard positions because if you look at it, um, Thayer Mumford and Nicholas petit Ferrer, those are going to be your tackles locked in. And then I, I do believe Harry Miller will be uh, the starting center. Now, the question is going to be is if you're looking to try to get your five best offense alignment on the field, will it be Juan Jones sliding over to guard? Will it be Paris Johnson, uh, the highly regarded five-star who showed that he can play at this level? Matthew Jones, uh, as you mentioned, played in the championship and played extremely well uh, against Clemson. So to me, I think the offensive line, trying to figure out who your five best guys are up front, that's going to be intriguing to me. I, I believe that in the end, it's going to be Paris Johnson and um, Matthew Jones who wins the starting guard positions, and, and Harry Miller will be your center. If that's the case, you're looking at – a very, very talented offensive line, highly regarded. My only concern is, is I think they have to still find a way to get Dewan Jones on the field. I know, I know there was a little bit of talk about him potentially entering the transfer portal. It could have been just a lot of hearsay and a lot of uh, conjecture, but if, if Dewan Jones doesn't see the field, I would be mildly concerned because I do believe he is talented enough to play at Ohio State. I think Dewan Jones has a heck of a future uh, ahead of him. So that's something to be looking forward to. And then will Donovan Jackson, the five star from Texas, who's going to be on campus, will he be someone that's going to push for that that second team uh, guard position? Because he's going to push a lot of those guys that are already there. But to me, I think it's going to be Paris Johnson, Matthew Jones, who will win the starting guard positions. Very well articulated and, you know, I, I mean, all the way across the board, but I do want to touch on Dewan Jones specifically because there were some rumblings. Maybe he could transfer and everything sounds like that has cooled down, thankfully. Um, you know, as you said, man, he's going to be at the very worst, the number six offensive lineman. And if all five starting offensive linemen play well and stay healthy, great. I mean, the chances of that happening, I mean, somebody's going to get banged up and, and maybe they could rotate here and there. So have a guy like Dewan Jones as your sixth man, so to speak who could come in there and start, you know, if anybody gets hurt or is not playing well, that's huge. So, yeah, I, I'm with you on that 100%. Very well said. All right, my friend, defensive side of the ball. Give me a couple of uh, position groups that intrigue you as far as position battles and who are going to win those position battles. Yeah, let's look at the def defensive end position opposite of Tyreek Smith because you can go ahead and pencil Tyreek Smith in as the starter 
on one side. Will it be Zach Harrison? Will the light bulb come on finally for him? Uh, or are you going to be looking at Tyler Friday or Javante Jean Baptiste? So those those spots right there are going to be something to keep an eye on because Ohio State desperately need Zach Harrison to live up to his hype. One of the things that you saw from the defensive line last year is they were very productive, very disruptive. If you look at the PFF, they were ranked, you know, at least, you know, top five in getting pressures, but they couldn't always get home to clean up the sack. I thought Tyree Smith played well down the stretch. If he can stay healthy, that's going to be key for him because if he can stay healthy and he can build off what he was doing against Clemson, he's going to be making a lot of money in the NFL. But they desperately need that other side of the defensive end position to step up. They need a guy who's going to be consistent getting out for the, the quarterback. Everybody thought that Zach Harrison, the five-star guy coming in, was going to be the next a uh, big name splash at that position uh, following after Chase Young. And he hasn't lived up to the expectations. I thought he had a subpar season last year. Um, but at the end of the day, that is going to be critical on how well the back end play, because if you can't get after the quarterback, you're going to leave uh, that secondary exposed. So I think it's critical for them to really solidify that other defense in position. And then after that, start building depth. If I had to choose, I think it's going to be Tyler Friday um, over Zach Harrison. And because I need to see it to believe it from Zach. I, I have all the faith in the world in him. I think he is probably the most gifted one of the defensive ends when it comes to pure and raw talent out of all of those guys, but until he can put it all together, I think that Zach Her um, I think that Tyler Friday will be him out. But at the end of the day, all of those guys will be in the rotation because Larry Johnson will play four to five defensive guys depending on the passing down situations. All right, let's close the show looking at the 2021 Big Ten race, so to speak. Ohio State, I'm assuming Jay Book is your pick to be the East champion uh, with that massive assumption out of the way. Who do you think is going to be the second best team in the Big Ten East? Last year, it was Indiana. You think it'll be the Hoosiers again? You think it'll be Penn State? Could the rivals to the North rise up? Somebody else? Who's going to be the second best team in the Big Ten East? Yeah, I still think it's going to be Indiana again. I think Tom Allen is doing a heck of a job with that program. They, they have quite a bit of talent coming back there. Uh, I, I believe that Michigan, they're going to be Michigan. They're going to drop several games as usual. If they're planning on playing a true freshman quarterback there with a with an offensive line that has been depleted in the offseason, I think they're really going to struggle, especially with them switching from a 4-3 to a 3-4. Michigan doesn't have the personnel. Uh, up front yet to be successful running the 3-4 because you're going to need some big guys in the middle, some space eaters, and you're going to need some size up front. And what what was one of the knocks for Michigan? And that was they were undersized up front. Penn State, um, you know, what are they? Was last year an anomaly that they were that bad under James Franklin? I, I think so. I thought they started to play a little bit better down the stretch. But at but when you compare them to Indiana, I just think that Indiana is slightly better than Penn State right now. I'm not sure where that Indiana Penn State game is at. I didn't look it up, but that's going to be a critical one that could decide who is the second team in the Big Ten East. And if you're if we're looking at the West, uh, I think Wisconsin will bounce back there. They have a lot of their guys coming back. Uh, not a not a ton of NFL departures, and with the year where guys get an extra year, I think Wisconsin will be a team that will bounce back. I believe that they were just ravaged by COVID, and once that happened, you know, they pretty much almost packed in the season up there at Wisconsin. So I, I look for them to bounce back and potentially win the West, and then I don't know if Northwestern has to the capability to repeat what they did last year because that was a very senior-laden veteran squad. Uh, a lot of those guys are moving on. So to me, I'm looking I'm looking at Iowa. I think uh, Iowa's going to be a team that's going to uh, compete for the Big Ten West. They always seem to drop a game or two that they shouldn't 
So the top two teams there I'm looking at to come out of the Big Ten West is Wisconsin and Iowa. And hopefully this year all games are played. There's no issues with uh, games being missed and players having to sit out for 20 days and a bunch of that nonsense that we had this year. And if that's the case where everything is back to normal, you're going to start seeing some of your uh, major your major teams on the West who are used to being up there at the top coming back to that pecking order uh, as far as Wisconsin and, and, and Iowa. And I think a lot of people need to keep an eye on Nebraska because if Nebraska, if they struggle, which it, it appears that they may because they've been hit with a significant amount of um, guys transferring out, it's going to be interesting to see if that's going to be the end of the Scott Frost tenure there because he's a, He's a Nebraska through and through guy, but it just doesn't seem like the program is heading in the right direction under his leadership. Fantastic insights, as always, from Jonah Booker. Thank you very much, Jay Book. Thank you to all of the listeners out there for tuning in the show. We appreciate that very much. Hope all of you have a great day and a great weekend. Let's hear that Buckeye swag, best damn band in the land. (laughs) 